Русский храм, путник Восток, с человеком на борту. Welcome to 2020 and to the Undisciplined Podcast, episode 6. Sorry we've been a bit quiet lately. Personal life, moving continents played a role in that, but we're back. We're still going and we have great episodes lined up for 2020. We kick the year off with a conversation with Professor Andrew Culp from the California Institute of the Arts. We start talking about his book, Dark Deloys, but the conversation goes in many directions and Please enjoy this episode, and I look forward to a new year with lots of other great guests. Let's go. Andrew, thank you very much for speaking to me, or should I say Professor Culp? Uh, You know, I teach at an art school, so everyone goes by their first name. (laughs) Okay, thanks, Andrew. So... Um, before we start, do you mind telling just a little bit of your background academically, uh, where you studied before, what your research interests are, uh, what you're doing right now? Yeah, excellent. So I am an academic. I currently teach at the California Institute of the Arts. I had a number of different teaching positions before then um, at a variety of contexts in the rhetoric program, in an emerging media program. And I completed my degree in comparative studies, which was largely a theory degree with a cultural studies and media studies background at The Ohio State University. And I also have a background in heterodox economics and philosophy broadly. I also come to my work with a lot of political concerns. I worked as a a, a professionally within radical politics for a number of years. And it's something that I actually found I could pursue better and more within the context of academic work. And so I'm sure today we're going to be talking about my work on Deleuze, but I also write broadly on the digital, digital culture, computation, cybernetics, media, comparative media studies, materiality, and then a variety of cultural studies things as well as they intersect with radical politics. Oh, cool. So what's interesting to me that you mentioned is that you worked for a number number of years practically in radical politics, as you said, and then you decided that you can pursue that more effectively within academia. So I think from the conversations that I've had with, you know, people I know in academia, some people feel fr- feel exactly the opposite way. They feel frustrated that they are sitting in an ivory tower and not involved in practicing their, you know, their, their praxis. So... Do you mind, I find that very intriguing, do you mind explaining to me maybe what you did when you were working in radical politics and why you feel that academia is a better outlet for you? Absolutely. So I got my political start actually after I got my start reading philosophy and theory. I was a academic debater in both high school and college, and I was part of a critical turn in which we read authors like uh, Foucault and other folks whose work is very uh, political in nature. And I was largely cynical about politics, but then I got radicalized uh, in college and ended up doing a lot of campus activism that is something that I still uh, feel very strongly about. I obviously think there are limitations of the type of student activism that it can occur, but I feel that that's a site and opportunity that a lot of people get their sort of taste of radical politics for the first time, sometimes in and against the institutional context in which they are. I went mm-hmm. on then to work uh, professionally uh, for ACORN, which is a neighborhood organizing group that is basically like a union for neighborhoods, and it famously got killed due to a right-wing smear campaign um, that had edited videos uh, that gave an excuse for uh, the Republican uh, Congress to lead a very sustained attack campaign. And then I worked on anti-war materials, both or uh, for an anti-war organization, both Uh, on a research uh, capacity, but then also working on some uh, student campaigns against the University of California's nuclear laboratories. And how do you see your role now as an academic? How does that tie in with your political viewpoints and your political aims? Absolutely. So uh, 
When working for a traditional organization, uh, it takes on a very classical sort of employer-employee relationship in which you have to sort of submit yourself to an organization from whom you're getting a paycheck. And so it means that sometimes you get involved in work that you don't believe in. It means that you often uh, have to do campaigns because your boss told you to do so. And it also Mm -hmm. means that there's a wider sort of power network. So I can give you one example. I was helping some students do a hunger strike, and it was a coordinated hunger strike across the state of California. There were 55 students all going on hunger strike together. And then it turns out that there were donor circles common from the university to the foundation that I was working for who started putting pressure on my boss and my organization to make it end. And so Mm -hmm. obviously there are some sort of pressures in the university when you start working there as a researcher and an academic, but hopefully it's never as crude or as vulgar as the person who controls the purse strings coming to you and saying, uh, you're not allowed to research this anymore. Um, There is at least some sort of academic freedom that still exists that gives people an opportunity to really think and write what they really feel. Um, Though, obviously, the run towards tenure and peer review, you know, it it gets complicated. But I feel like the freedom and the opportunity of the position that I currently have opens me up to a form of radicalism that wasn't available in my previous jobs. You know, there's a lot of talk about the neoliberalization of academia. Do you think that these conditions that you speak of and you say it's not perfect but it's at least something how long do you think that's going to be sustainable given this onslaught of uh, you know universities being run more and more like businesses yeah that's a great question i mean um there are a few different intersecting dimensions here the first is that the neoliberal university, at least in North America, is following the model of austerity that is largely self-imposed. So if we track neoliberalism is this, as this 1970s transformation in which there's not only incredible financialization, but a move towards sort of private funding of previously public resources. One of the institutions that hit, that's hit the most is public universities. And so they flip their funding model from being largely state funded to being largely tuition funded, which is something that we're seeing nationally here. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure it's the case um, in another other countries, number of other countries. And that means that a lot of the money that's being spent at universities is being directed not towards classrooms or teachers, though that happens sometimes, but towards building new facilities to attract students. So cafeterias, yeah. dormitories, the whole uh, university experience and a class of the employees that they are hiring are not the upper administration. There's been plenty of upper administrative bloat in the same way in which CEO uh, salaries have risen in other industries. But it's in a new class of staff who work to manage programs around the campus in which they try and make students uh, get the most out of being at college. So um, more student group management, having impromptu concerts, having a food night, just all these random things start happening. And yeah. in, in some ways, some of the things that I do benefit from that because our current generation, uh, Gen Z, sees themselves as activists. Now, what exactly that means, who really knows? Um, but they really like seeing themselves as being engaged doing politics, Mm. being radical, wanting to transform and change this world that they got from previous generations who maybe didn't think the same way. And so there are ways in which my profile and other people like me who are people who came out of student or other forms of radical activism found their ways in the university that uh, were getting supported at least on a lip service diversity level of uh, these new and changing priorities of the university. Yeah, thank you. That sorry that the, these questions about the university were a bit of a tangent. What I would like to talk about now is so you wrote a very wonderful and how should I say it's a book that generated a lot of conversations uh about what is it now 2 years ago? Um speaking of Dark Deloitte. Sure. Yeah, um, 2016, so maybe even a few more than that now. Yeah, three years. Yeah, sorry I'm coming to this a bit late, three years late. But um, 
yeah so as i said it's it's a really great book and i enjoyed it thoroughly but i have to start with one question to ask you so in this time and also if you think what two, three years ago that's 2016 mm -hmm. thinking about that year in the history of your own country and many other places around the world in this times these times that we are living in and the news that we are getting every day why do we need more darkness why are you writing a book trying to darken our days sure so like a lot of academic books, you know, it was written before it was published. So it came out in 2015 before the whole Trump fiasco. Um, and actually deep in the days of the Obama administration, um, mm -hmm. who I see as a very technocratic liberal. So who had won over a whole series of the left through a campaign based on hope and change, but it turned into be a completely sort of empty signifier that anyone could sort of project into it anything they wanted. And so I think that is a perfect sort of synopsis of what a lot of optimism has been. It's very empty. It's tied to a series of structural reforms and challenges that um, are not really addressed in a significant way. And then it's a lot of the continuing the business of normal. And there's this concept I really like from Guy Debord from his Society of the Spectacle, the sort of classic mid-century text looking at sort of France and its industrialization as well as the importance of cinema and film and our changing media and psychological landscape of urbanism. And he thought that in spite of all this massive change that was going on around him at the time, he published it in the, uh, the mid-60s, it is a perpetual present. And I think that was mm -hmm. a really challenging notion at the time that I found very interesting. He said, for all these changes, they're just sort of on the surface and that there's not really a serious transformation. There's not a shift from the world as we know it to something else. They're not really giving a new future. And I think that in 2015, 2016, we are seeing that. And I think that it's even more the case right now that we know exactly what the future is, to, is, is giving us right now. And it's not a genuinely new or different future. And it's time to finally ask for something else. And so my proposition is it doesn't come from hope and optimism that something will change, but it comes from actively working against everything that makes up this world. And so that requires a certain level of darkness and destruction. Yeah, that's interesting. I, out of my own uh, stupidness, didn't think of the fact that you wrote this during the, during the Obama administration, for example. So yeah, that puts it in a very different light for me and it makes a lot of sense but then also on the other hand you're saying about the society of the spectacle and these superficial changes perhaps what i think is also surprising or not surprising depending on who you ask is that you know as disastrous as as trump is for america and for the world you know and many people were convinced that it's the end of the world but then in many ways you know he's governing with with the exception of his kind of media personality with the decorations around it at, at its core he's he's governing probably pretty much how most republican candidates would have performed or would have filled that job absolutely so there was certainly a social transformation that happened in and through Trump's presidency in which a number of largely marginalized right-wing forces white supremacists, neo-Nazis, uh, extreme sexist, patriarchal, so-called men's rights activists started bubbling to the surface. And so the mainstream started seeing them for the first time. And it really freaked out the liberal centrists who had not really seen people like this in front of them. They'd been either completely marginalized them or had never even heard from them before. As someone who'd been working in radical politics and is, was very online at that time, I'd known they were around. I knew it was very common. I knew they were a very serious force to deal with. And so for me, I wasn't shocked. Mm. And so maybe one great anecdote I can tell is I was trying to process it myself because I was around people who were really freaking out and I was not so inclined to do it myself. And so I emailed a friend who's an old school, like hardcore anarchist punk whose mm. parents lived through uh, a coup in Argentina. And they, he said, 
you know, when things are really bad, you'll know it. And talking to his parents, he's like, they lived through something absolutely terrifying. But what's going on now is just a little bit more naked form, a little bit more aggressive and open form of conservative (laughs) capitalism. And that's, you know, this is things that people have been dealing with for a long time. And it's maybe just like Reagan, it has shades of Bush. And so if we focus too much on the personalities and we focus too much on the politicians, we lose our structural analysis of the situation. And we suddenly think that everything is novel and new. When he sort of pointed that out to me, I started thinking, oh man, all of the protests against Trump suddenly look like all the protests against uh, George W. Bush that happened in the early 2000s when I was really politically active for the first time. And I bet they're the exact same way in which the protests against Reagan or Thatcher or a number of other politicians like them were too. So anyway, I don't want to speak too much about, as you said, we shouldn't get stuck on personalities, but we should look at structure. So to return to your book, is it fair for me to describe it as a manifesto? (laughs) Sure. So the for those of you all who haven't seen it, and there's a paid copy you can get. Fortunately, it's very inexpensive, and it's been translated in numerous languages, including uh, German and Japanese, Spanish. There's a French translation that's going to be done soon. Um, you can also read the English version online for free through the University of Minnesota Press's Manifold platform, which is a new experimental system. But anyway, mm. um, enough of the self-promotion. Uh, <laughs> The form of the book includes an introduction that is written much more like a traditional essay, though in a very uh, straightforward uh, style in which it absolutely knows who it's trying to engage with and the argument it's trying to propose. And then two thirds of the book is a series of contrasting concepts in which I find original concepts that are developed by the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze, sometimes in collaboration uh, with his uh, a writing partner, Félix Guattari. And then I propose a different concept that should be put in its place to meet the sort of changing conditions of our new dark world of 2015. So the traditional essay, I sometimes describe it as polemical. I think a manifesto would be great. And it's very much almost like a manual of new ideas that I hope people put to use. Yeah. Or even one of the ways I read it was I kind of look at it as a guidebook on methodology almost. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm uh, very intentional about the style that I use when I write and I really want it to be clear how an argument unfolds and has developed. The people who were kind enough to host me while I was writing the majority of it were at the University of Washington, part of a history of ideas program, as well as a geography program. And Mark Purcell in particular, who who helped bring me, um, is a maximalist. So he writes everything. He considers all the tangents. He goes in all the different Mm -hmm. directions. And my style tends to be the opposite, where I think a lot I put ideas on paper, but then when it comes to writing the actual manuscript itself, I try and create a very clear through line where you Mm. can follow the argument. You can see how and why I'm arguing the way that I am. And that, you know, in other places I use other methods, but for this one, it's really thought that is guiding itself. So really trying to keep an idea as it continues. Yeah. I want just as an aside, the language itself, the prose that you're using, I find it's much more colorful than traditional academic writing and it's actually something that's fun and engaging to read apart oh, from the content I, th- I think that a lot of academic philosophy risks being a commentary on other people's works and mm. what it does is then it shoves it back into the history of philosophy which it considers once again as one big arc almost like the same sort of perpetual present that Guy Debord was trying to avoid And so a key concept from Deleuze is the idea of a difference that makes a difference. And in fact, Mm -hmm. I really like Francois Zorovich-Villis' interpretation of Deleuze, in which Deleuze is a thinker of an event. And the event where that difference changes everything so much that the future no longer looks like what came before it. And it's a true difference then when it actually destroys an image of the present. And so I had in the back of my hand this image of sort of what it meant to write, to try and write in such a forceful way that 
instead of putting it in the history to sort of make a break from that history and create something genuinely novel and new. Yeah, I think that really comes through. And what I also really enjoyed, I get the feeling that you enjoy playing uh, etymological games as much as I do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that part where uh, there's there's a couple of inst- instances in the book where you, you really go into, I know it's kind of a philosophical tradition too, but where you really unpack some etymologies and reinterpret from that. I, that's always, apart from being insightful, always just a lot of fun for me. So I really like that. Oh, excellent. Yeah. I mean, Nietzsche is a great inspiration for me, trained as a philologist. Obviously, there are a few contemporary versions of this otherwise sort of dead practice, um, like Giorgio Agamben. But also, mm. I like tracing it through a variety of other structuralists who do this. Most recently, I've been reading a lot of the structural comparative mythologists who themselves are deeply committed to very old ideas and trying to figure out how they precisely worked given that there's very little material to work through. And so it requires a sort of really deep engagement with a few different ideas, and a few cultural documents and a small amount of artifacts. So one more question about generally about the book is why did you specifically, because I think a lot of what is written in Dr. Liz is not coming from Deleuze, it's coming from Andrew Culp. So why are you shining the Andrew Culp laser through the lens of Deleuze? Oh, why Deleuze? Yeah. Why Why, why him? Yeah. I, I guess some of it is personal and idiosyncratic. I really fell in love with Foucault in late high school and early college and got a lot out of him, still continue to get a lot out of his work. But then I sort of hit a certain point where Foucault says that in some interviews that he believes in hyper-pessimistic activism, and I find that an interesting sort of method, but he didn't really Mm -hmm. pose much of an alternative. For him, power, he says in his famous essay, Subjects in, in Power, that power is almost like a great game of wrestling in which the forces are always sort of contending in and against each other. And it seemed Mm. a little too internal to me. And Mm. one thing that I'd heard from people and I'd read a little bit was that Deleuze and particularly Deleuze with Guattari had been writing about an outside, uh, about nomads, about a war machine that sort of fights these uh, constituted islands of states and concepts and fascisms. And so I got really, really interested in Deleuze. And in fact, the reason I went to the graduate school that I did was to work with Eugene Holland, who is the one of the first people to run an academic reading group for Deleuze and Guattari in the United States uh, around Antiedipus, mm-hmm. uh, when he himself was a student of Frederick Jameson in San Diego. And Mm. he'd written excellent, sort of the first really great book explaining anti-Oedipus in really rigorous, but also very readable terms. And so I sought him out. I knew that he had a pedigree, not only as a commentator on D&G, but also was committed to their political and social ideas, uh, which is something that I really wanted to explore. And I sort of set myself to work with him. And so in some ways, it's a very short, my my book is a short pithy commentary on the list, but it's also the Mm. product of a side project all the way through graduate school of learning Deleuze and being in sort of communities of scholars talking in and through Deleuze. And even though it appears very much like an outsider commentary, it's in part my attempt to make a break from a lot of the commentary written about Deleuze too. So more to the real content of the book, you argue for a kind of anti-politics. Now, I'm, I've am i got my suspicion that I think you have a punk background somewhere, <laughs> but I, could, I, I don't know if I'm right or wrong about that, but you argue for anti-politics. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I think... Uh... You're very smart to pick up on that. I've operated in and around the punk world for a little while, though it's funny, it's it's somewhat recent. It's maybe within the last 10 to 15 years. It wasn't sort of my upbringing as a, as a kid or a teen. It wasn't even something that I was involved in in college. It was something that I found afterward. But yeah, punk has this sort of anti-political ethos where it is very rebellious. It's van- very anti-authoritarian. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it doesn't it 
invest itself in the formal political institutions it's trying to fight. And so every once in a while, there'll be someone who's like the punk rock politician who tries to become a mayor of a town or run for city council or something. Yeah. And then the rest of the punks just sort of look at them and be like, what are you doing? That's that's the least punk rock thing you could be doing at all. Um, yeah. And th- there's an alternative. When I was in Canada last week, I was asked about someone on terms of anti-politics and they say, oh, I know a lot of people who've bought land. They, they've moved in the country. They maybe were previously punks, but now they're waiting to just watch the whole world burn while they've created a new society and a new way of living for themselves. And I think that for me, while I understand the allure of back to the land, I find the direct being embedded in the places where it needs it most and really providing a confrontational voice. That's really what anti-politics looks like to me. Yeah. So also maybe one of the places where I got this kind of feeling from you was when you say in your book about communication and networks and systems and what you're saying is that instead of using that, we need to work through underground networks and subvert the uh, the existing channels that in which we are expected to express ourselves politically. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think that these are all really important ideas. There's, you know, been a consistent anarchist dimension to all of this, and I consider myself very involved in anarchist. Yeah, that was politics. my next. <laughs> yeah. My next question was about anarchism. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, the the underground networks is something that certain versions of anarchists have always been sort of tied to. And if we look at sort of generations of critical theorists, D&G, though themselves coming from slightly different generations, Deleuze being sort of a generation older than Guattari, Guattari was very involved in sort of post-World War II communist, for a short time even Trotskyist, which is to say non- or anti-Soviet sort of communist groups that were very much about youth culture, about counterculture. And then when 1968 comes around, especially in France and Western Europe, there's this new version of the new left that for some people still maintains a radical anarchist or Marxist orientation, but that that's still, you know, the Liz is kind of a funny figure because he's sort of old for that. Yeah, that's interesting. And what that makes me think of immediately now that you say punks who are running for government and then they get criticized for that is one criticism that I've been hearing lately on the left. Mostly people associated with maybe the DSA or socialism in general Mm -hmm. saying that one of the, as a kind of self-critique of the left, saying that the left has become too afraid of power. Mm -hmm. And then they cite things like Occupy Wall Street or perhaps to an degree to a some degree now extinction rebellion so some on the left are doing this self criticism saying that we cannot shy away from power we cannot leave power over to the right what what do you make of that yeah i think it's kind of a funny critique because maybe it's people who aren't aware of the whole history of leftist governments for the last 100 years there have been quite a few of them and i do not have a very optimistic uh, opinion of any of them And so in places like the United States, where people say, if only we could have a democratic socialist government, I just sort of threw my hands up and say, that's, that's all you want. You want this very minimal, insignificant thing that there's a whole history of compromise, moderation, failure, quite insignificant policies. I mean, it it affects people's lives, obviously, to have an affirmative biopolitics of something like universal health care. But to think that that's the horizon of where things need to be going, I think that that's just uh, far too limited in perspective. And so the politics that I fight for is utopian. It is deeply revolutionary, not just in a seizing of the state sort of way, but in a complete radical transformation of everything that exists, as well as an abolition of something like the economy. And so I feel like psychologically or maybe even pathologically there's something going on where people feel like they've been losing long enough that they're willing to be satisfied by very marginal gains in something like having a few more representative voices that sound like them in a legislative body or even being able to finally have the person in power who's able to set the agenda but i feel like my agenda is far too ambitious and far too radical to ever be represented in any sort of governmental form that they're looking at. yeah I mean, I totally agree with you, but then one personal thing that I've been struggling with 
and I'd like to hear your opinion is on the spectrum of utopianism and then kind of compromising on something that you know is is a good thing where does that line draw do you because I think some people would say let's take what we can get it's obviously better than what we have now yeah. and it seems foolish to throw that out and say no we we're pushing for the way when do we compromise when do we say no thanks and push further so there was a position that was put forward maybe about 10 15 years ago that was about uh posing infinite demand simon, simon critchley writes this book infinitely demanding in which he says okay sure pose demands but pose demands that are so impossible to meet that the state tries to accommodate you in every instance, works as hard as it can to capture you, but you're still so far uh, beyond and more ambitious than what it can do that you're the one sort of uh, once again furthering the agenda and the state is doing everything that it can to just sort of nip at your heels. And that's where I generally fit. And maybe this is just due to the social structural position that I've adopted. You know, I'm an academic, not a politician. I will never run for office. I've intentionally, you know, put myself in a position where I will never run for office. And so I feel that at least my approach is to be untimely, to ask for things that we absolutely need and want and deserve, but maybe there's not enough of a will. There's maybe not even enough of a appreciation to, to need or want it right now, because there's uh, there would be nothing more terrible than for me to put forward a very practical, a very immediate thing, get it, and then look back at history about all of the terrible compromises that would come from it. So I can give one example. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the uh, seize power faction is really behind universal basic income. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the actual rail politique that would have to happen for universal basic income to happen, it would happen through a far left and a far right coalition because their, yeah. in, their interests converge over monetizing social services. So this is why uh, Hayek and libertarians have been pro UBI for a long time because they see it as an alternative to the social welfare state in which you give someone a lump of money and then they spend the lump of money the way that they choose. And then you blame them for their decisions if they choose not to, to, uh, use that lump of money on their own social well-being, on healthcare, on food or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's also a way in which you can scale back social services at the same time and allow all of those services provided by people who take the currency or the money that you're offering in terms of universal basic income. And so yeah. if there's a purely left UBI that both further entrenched the welfare state and gave people universal basic income, I think it might sort of start to coincide with some of my anti-economic uh, communism. But if it doesn't, mm -hmm. if it passes through the what I'd imagine to be the practical way of having libertarians also use it as a way of further neoliberalizing and cannibalizing the state, um, which is the most likely way, I think they will get their policy, but they will ultimately sell the uh, sell down the river the exact vision that they would need in order to implement in a way that would benefit people. Yeah. And uh, what you're saying about infinite demands, I think it feels to me a bit almost worldwide that it's exactly the right that's playing this game of infinite demands. And so far over the last 10 or 20 or 30 years, it's served them quite well, it seems. Absolutely. You know, when people talk about the Overton window and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a way for them to move the goalposts in which they are never satisfied. And so they keep pushing it more and more and, a direction that they want. And I, I think it's quite effective because ultimately with a liberal democratic capitalist state, it is looking to do at least a certain version of consensus building with its uh, electorate. And so if the electorate can uh, be very active, but also be very disinvested or misinvested in a certain way where it's keeping on mm -hmm. pushing it in new and different directions. And I think that that's actually how people can sort of push in and against the state in the sort of British autonomist sort of fashion in which, um, you know, someone like, oh, what's his name? John Holloway, uh, 
and uh, people who are government workers who came up with this formulation where they said in and against. So they'll work in the state, but only ultimately to work against it. And then finally, in the 90s, they also appended beyond. So you pose mm. demands that are in, against, and beyond because you need to keep open that sort of horizon or else you'll just slide into the pragmatics of policymaking and you'll be staring at sheets of numbers all day and trying to just sort of make everything uh, part of one big consensus. Yeah. Also, to change the direction, but only very slightly, you mentioned uh, we've talked about the DSA and you talk about your communist economics. I cannot help but when I read your book, Dr. Delois, Delois, I feel like what you're talking about a lot of the time is you're talking about anarchism. Mm -hmm. Is that a label that you identify with? Absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I found anarchism uh, a long time ago, and I think it's always sort of resonated with me. I grew up in a very conservative city in a conservative part of the country. And so um, I had a difficult time figuring out my own politics for a while. And then mm. once I had uh, anarchism presented to me, uh, it just made so much sense. And I think there are battles within anarchism to figure out precisely what is it. For some people, it's very much about the founding figures of anarchism in the 19th century who opposed the three pillars of the state, the capital, and religion, or state capitalism mm -hmm. and religion. And then there is a sort of new anarchism, uh, almost a cultural anarchism that comes with the new left that I think happened globally in a lot of places. Though I suppose an mm -hmm. intervening one would be uh, sort of anarchists and nationalist contexts fighting in and through sort of decolonization, people's liberation struggles. Um, and then there's the sort of creative or alternative left, which is, or anarchism, which is the one that's always appealed to me the most. So, you know, the fringe elements of surrealism, Dada and the avant-garde, which also slides into situationism, mm -hmm. um, various forms of philosophical anarchisms, and not the sort of passes dimension, but the more sort of um, confronting and challenging the world in a way that we destroy the world as we know it and come up with something completely different and new. And I think that that anarchism is the one that's always sort of motivated me. Yeah, that's definitely a, a thread or a feeling that I feel runs throughout your book, especially one line or one idea that you put forward that I think is really, you know, thought provoking in our very like mass media, social media time period is that you said that we have too much communication now and that we should create more non-communication. And that for me encapsulates a very anarchist attitude to, you know, like, as we said, some on the left who maybe want to embrace power, what I interpret you as saying is talking about a withdrawal from, from the system, from hierarchy and not trying to grab it or co-opt it and not fighting it head on, but, you know, like a river just flowing around a mountain instead of trying to crash over it. Absolutely. And these, these moments for me are punctuated throughout the work of uh, Deleuze in particular. And we see the figure showing up in different places in different ways. Most famously, it's probably the war machine of both Anti-Oedipus and A Thousand Plateaus, in which mm. he's working with Guattari to imagine people who live outside and without the state, drawing on mm. not only anthropology, but just a wide range of sources from early history to religion, architecture, math, physics. I mean, it just covers everything. But then also the communication bit comes out in two very important places. One, his last collaboration with Guattari, uh, What is Philosophy?, in which they're arguing for a new version of philosophy. And they say that philosophy that sees itself as part of a dialogue, like in the ancient tradition, or mm -hmm. like communication in terms of consensus building by working through groups of constituencies, like in the modern let's say, German post-Frankfurt school tradition, um, they say they want nothing to do with. And instead, for philosophy, it should be inventing concepts, but in a way that allows someone to pose a new world, connect mm -hmm. completely different way with the universe. And ultimately, they say, 
It's a utopian vision that confronts everything about contemporary capitalism and opens up a path to a, a new, new way of seeing everything. And so I find that, that quite ambitious. But then Deleuze also, perhaps in the most important bit on communication, he writes this essay, kind of retrospectively looking back at his whole body of work, but also commenting a bit on Foucault's notions of power. And he says, Foucault leaves us at some point with disciplinary power, which is very much the power of centralized institutions that create their own forms of technique and knowledge and uh, manipulation and control of bodies. And he says that we're now out of that. We're now in a much more decentralized form of power in which mm. institutions themselves no longer try and create their own isolated logic, but they circulate together. And we can see mm. this through various forms of liberalism, capitalist liberalism, but also especially neoliberalism, in which institutional logic sort of shift and coordinate and work together in that capitalism and notions of efficiency and optimization tend to just sort of put them all together. Perhaps the most mm. scary version of it is the way in which Silicon Valley is taking a very narrow set of ideas and precepts and even instructions at the level of code and then applying them to all aspects of social life as we know it. And so he says that this is looking at the problems of the world as problems of communication, in which they try and fill up, fill in the gap with various ideas about what communication is. And he says that we need to renounce those forms of communication because it's the only thing that allows us to sort of get outside of it. And so I think a great sort of next step for, for people who are less familiar is um, this group Tikkun, who was a, a radical collective that was around for about two years, right at the turn mm -hmm. of the millennium. And just now some of their early work is getting retranslated and they have a piece called the cybernetic hypothesis, in which they say that early 20th century notions of putting things in communication through engineered control systems has become a way of seeing all of the ways in which governance operates in our current moment. And I think it's mm -hmm. just a beautiful text. And they themselves also introduce notions of noise, and fog, and interference in order to create zones of uh, opacity, which they say is the only way to sort of carve out a living, but then also a strategically optimal way to uh, challenge and confront the growing system of, they say, global governance of empire. Yeah, that also, you mentioned empire. I think that this conception of power is also effectively uh, represented or described, you know, of course, by Hart and Negri, where you have this, you know, labyrinthine structure of power and communication. But then what you say in your book too is that you say these labyrinths of complex systems they can have two effects on us that they can mobilize us or they can paralyze us and i understand that you're saying or what i'm understanding when you say that we can withdraw from this tidal wave of communication that would be a a, a mobilizing energy but when i look around me i think that this mountain of complexity around us and complex communications is having a paralyzing effect on us, rather. Yes, I, I, I think that's so smart to pick up on that thread because not that it's necessarily true, but I think one dimension in which society has been thought for a while, particularly by sociologists, is through energetics. So mm. they see that there's an attempt to map and then mobilize and reconfigure energies of society. Perhaps one of the uh, most difficult and um, challenging moments of this is sort of uh, this question of total mobilization, which was seen in the early 20th century around the world wars in which all of society is sort of mobilized. And at least from the European perspective, um, it was being suggested by people on the far right as well, some on the left, Uh, that it was necessary because the whole region was uh, falling into a nihilism where people were unable to sort of uh, mobilize themselves. I don't think we're in the same situation now, but I think that looking at those energetics now in our contemporary moment would be very interesting. Um, I don't think it's so much about people being afraid of descending into nihilism. I think it's more about fragmentation. I mm. think it's about apathy because of being overwhelmed 
I think yeah. it's an anxiety through an inability to process an enormous disparate amount of information that we're sort of confronted with every day. And so the sort of paralyzingness isn't so much about a loss of virtue, but it's about um, that we're being called to act in so many small ways constantly that we're sort of hitting a limit at a certain point. It's not to say that there won't be new and more complex ways in which we're sort of called to do things. But I do feel that there's this sort of existential crisis that we're going through, uh, feeling very much torn apart and not being able to remain in control of our own drives and instincts and ability to make even simple decisions. Yeah. And I think the problem that I see with that with mobilizing is if we're talking about this, you know, dispersed or networked power and hierarchy and structures is what is the target that we mobilize against? Where do we go? What's really been in the news now is the the climate again with, uh, I'm not even sure how to say her name, but Greta Thunberg, Thunberg mm -hmm. uh, you know, who's making it really clear and really apparent that we're all, I don't want to say us all, but at least those in power and those in charge are asleep at the wheel. Mm -hmm. So, on the one hand, the, the the threats are very clear, but on the other hand, who to target, who to mobilize against, what to do. Mm -hmm. My general feeling most days is just one of real impotence. Yeah, I think um, this is where I think sometimes Foucault can be helpful, sometimes DNG, but the broad feeling that I have is that power in the late 20th century, due to a variety of transformations in social thought as well as policy, has become environmental. It's become atmospheric. And that's why yeah. climate change is both such a powerful and significant case, but also sort of symptomatic of a larger problem, which is institutions stopped trying to directly apply force, and instead their first tool was to try and create a atmosphere or a milieu or an environment that encourages subjects to act in a certain way. And so it, you act indirectly if you're able to pattern their available avenues for action, mm. you're able to um, nudge them in certain directions by creating incentive structures that do not require actually applying force yourself, but let's say having community block grants to encourage nonprofits to do educational programming. And suddenly you have this sort of complex environment or ecosphere of uh, knowledge and actions, and it becomes very unclear who's in charge, uh, if there's anyone even behind a wheel somewhere that you can get to stop. And I think that the response could be formally similar in which you say, okay, then we just need to fight a culture war. We need to get up and stand up and, and get angry. Or there's the social democratic response that you mentioned previously, which is, okay, you know, the right has in part abandoned institutions, so it's the perfect time for us to bring them back. Um, but for me, I think we can be even more am ambitious and look at these really deeply embedded social systems and finally start calling them into question like why the market or the economy or even the state are considered the ways in which to rule and govern our lives and come up with fundamentally different alternatives. Yeah. So what I'm also curious about, you talk, and this is setting up for the next question, which we'll come back to what we've discussed now, but you emphasize this idea in your book of withdrawing, but then also of antagonism and asymmetry. There's a underlying feeling of anger that I get. So I was wondering where, uh, f firstly, would you agree with, with that observation of mine? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Right. <laughs> so from there, where do you situate yourself and this book then within the tradition, which I take, I know from Carl Schmidt and the friend and enemy distinction, or then the more contemporary version of Chantal Mouf, like the agonistics, because people that I speak to, some people take this as a matter of fact or a matter of course, and others reject this friend enemy distinction or this asymmetry or antagonism. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, where, where do you place yourself? Absolutely. So I think that the first question about anger is spot on. Um, 
I was writing this when the movement for Black Lives Matter was perhaps getting the most attention that it would get. And I consider the two greatest contributions that will live on for a long time beyond simply, you know, naming and and asserting that uh, anti-Black violence is a constitutive element of society and it must be confronted if we're to make any sort of radical transformation. But the two contributions I see as one, a reckoning with the question of righteous anger and authorizing forms of righteous anger as politics. Mm. And the second being a critique of respectability politics, which is also sort of tone policing, telling people that they maybe have the right idea, but they're doing it the wrong way. Um, A lot of people around Black Lives Matter uh, really called out respectability politics, and it really sort of changed the conversation. I find that an essential sort of resource. And so for me, political anger has been there for a long time. I think it moves towards a sort of almost physics of power in Mm. which I'm actually quite disturbed about people who try and do politics without emotion. Mm. I think unemotional politics is everything that's wrong about it. I think that's uh, looking at politics from a distance, usually uh, detached in a very alienated way in which people have been able to make some of the worst monstrous decisions because they've been able to control, manipulate, perhaps even write whole groups of people out of existence because of Mm. their sort of seeming feel feelinglessness. Mm. And so I think political feeling is quite important. And, you know, it's there at the beginning of the anarchist and socialist tradition with someone like Charles Fourier too, who's very uh, invested in the question of feeling as a political project. And I think contemporary feminists have done a really great job sort of continuing that, that line of reasoning. I can speak to the Carl Schmidt and the friend enemy though. Yeah, please. Before you do that, I just thought it's the first time I thought about this idea that you said of like bringing emotion or anger into politics. And I I just immediately, my mind is making a connection between the kind of Christian or theological uh, concept of righteous indignation. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's a paper somewhere out there on that, that that might be interesting, but but please Mm -hmm. continue about Carl Schmidt. Yeah, certainly. And, and I should note that within theories of how religion and culture intersect. The Mm. religious is actually a really important theory of revolution and transformation everywhere from Anabaptists and various uh, 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 millenarian traditions that say that things are so bad in this world that there must be a complete transformation, Mm. whether the world being completely upside down or that we're in a place that is damned and it leads to an exodus, uh, exodus or a uh, confrontation. I think these are absolutely essential concepts, and um, atheists for a long time, I think, have been uh, mistakenly ignoring them. And I think that, you know, I have an Eric Hobsbawm book next to my bed right now that goes through outlaws and criminals and religious millenarians, and I think it's it's great, and I can't wait to finish it. Yeah, and I'm interrupting myself now, but even anarchism, at least how I interpret anarchist praxis, I think relates quite well to the idea of exodus, Mm -hmm. even if it's not a physical one or, 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 you know, a spatial one, at least a a social or communicative exodus. Yes. And exodus is a popular concept in the seventies with the Italian radicals who are hooked up with the new left, but also doing uh, confrontations in the streets and actually communists taking a distance from the formal communist party who had a relative amount of power then and had used anti-terrorism legislation enough to, to, to cleanse and fight off its more radical elements. And so I think that uh, Exodus is a really important concept and that, that people keep getting more and more out of it the more that we uh, return to it. Yeah. So I'm dying to hear about the friend and enemy. Yeah. So I can um, maybe present an anecdote. I did a directed study with a Italian autonomous Marxist maybe 10 years ago now. And, you know, autonomous tend to be very committed to the idea of exodus, this sort of getting outside the state uh, that worker power or other forms of power are prior to state capture, that capitalism is always falling behind, just trying to exploit things in the second instance. And the first is looking at this plentitude and transformation that's already happening with the multitude. And so we get to this question 
of the friend enemy and antagonism. And I posed to him like, and, and antagonism was a very important term for him. And I said, uh-huh. well, where does antagonism exist in a system that professes to be, if not anti-dialectical, presenting a very different dialectic that's not just between, uh-huh. let's say, the people and the state, between a, a constituency and a constituted power. It's trying to get outside of it in some way. Where does antagonism lie? And um, he, he was, he's, he's a brilliant thinker, but he just sort of looked at me for a second and he said, I, I'm not exactly sure. And then he gave me a response that I think both of us didn't find very satisfying. Mm. And so I would say that a lot of my thought in the last decade has been trying to reimagine what antagonism means outside of the previous generation of thinkers attempt to do it. So Chantal Mouffe, but also, you know, she gets her idea of agonism from Foucault, who in his Subjects in Power essay says that power is like agonism in the sense of Greek wrestlers. And when you look at that uh, image, it's two people or two powers that are sort of fighting each other. Mm. And I think that it's that sort of dynamic of the two that gets broken up with DNG when they think about the three. So for them, they say the state is a dialectic. It has a liberal and an authoritarian pole that's always bouncing back and reinforcing itself between these two approaches, which we would largely say conservative parties and uh, democratic socialist parties. And so they pose a third figure that exists outside the state that the state tries to capture, but that they keep forming an exodus or they keep being able to create a, a way of life outside of the state. And so for me, I think that uh, one has to reimagine the friend enemy distinction in that way as well. That the friend and the enemy isn't between the permissive liberal and the uh, conservative right wing, but it's between a figure that wants to break free of everything and create a new way of life, and then the system that actively tries to prevent any event that would mean its dissolution or uh, those subjects' freedom. Mm. Yeah, because what I hear reflected in that is I'm, uh, you know, I'm mainly interested and concerned with the work of Niklas Luhmann, who's, you know, a bit of a persona non grata on the left, but (laughs) who I find very interesting nonetheless. And he has this paper where he says, uh, I, I forget the title, but about barbarism. And he says, who are the barbarians now that all of us are Greeks? Mm. And <laughs> this is also like a kind of a development. It's a feeling that I think Carl Schmidt also felt. But what Luhmann says is why do we have in our, in our social self-description, it's become unacceptable to distinguish between Greeks and barbarians to use a kind of two general categories. Mm-hmm. We're all Greeks now, but nonetheless, we're left with vast exclusions and inequalities. And he poses this as the challenge to sociology to find a social self-description of inequality when all of us are Greeks. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And what I found interesting in your book is that you also invoke the image of the barbarian. And I love how you mentioned that the etymologically... The barbarian comes from the one who refuses to learn how to speak. And that what we said earlier about what we need is more non-communication. We we need more refusals to to speak and to learn the language of to, to learn Greek or to learn the language of power, if I can put it like that. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, Luman's an interesting figure here. Oh, I should mention first that the the barbarian I note initially was inspired by this critique of Hart and Negri's empire by some Italian anarchists going by the name of Criso and Odoteo. And their uh, piece is called Barbarians of the Disordered Insurgents, in which they say, for as much as Hart and Negri want to confront empire, they ultimately propose their alternative as sort of a mirror of empire. And instead, Criso and Odoteo say they want to stay outside the city gates They never want to learn the language of empire. They want to be barbarians who ultimately lay siege to it all. And I found that such a beautiful image. And I think for Luman, as well as the sort of mid-century question of informatics 
and for cybernetics, I think that we now have discourses, not just in the university, but with policymakers, within app developers, with everyone, where they think that they've found a sort of unitary system to describe everything. And information mm -hmm. tends to be that, in which they say, we, if, as long as we can encode it within a system of usually like numerary or some other mathematical representation, then we can capture it, we can have a model of it, and then we plug it all into a large feedback network, and then we can figure out where things should lie, what what is the ultimate harmony we want to make out of mm -hmm. it. And so the question of the barbarian in that instance is what can't be captured within whatever epistemology we're using in order to render uh, the real world into some sort of representative model? And what is the power of those things that never sort of make it in the system? Or that what is the power of the aspect or dimensions of things that don't make it into those large representative systems. And maybe a really good example of this in, in where I live in Los Angeles is there's just an enormous group of homeless people here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, official numbers say, I think 60,000, but I think it's easily probably four times that. Yeah. And, you know, there, no one knows what it means. And, Obviously, it means a failure of social systems as well as a failure of politics, but they can just be a population that needs services and charity and more of the things that we think that they lack. But I think the really sort of ambitious thing would be, what would it be to see the world through homelessness? And how could that actually show us that there's another world that people have been able to find a way to survive outside waged work without um, everything that we imagine takes to live and exist and not to sort of celebrate or valorize it, but mm -hmm. to understand that there's an outside and there's probably an outside in a lot of places in a lot of ways that we haven't considered. And that um, it's from that outside that uh, hope for something else really, really uh, continues to exist. I think maybe as the f as a final kind of theme that I want to ask you about, you talk about homelessness, and also we talked about Schmidt just now. Uh, you also bring up the idea in your book about uh, uh, the idea of normos, and what I particularly enjoyed was I think you're the first person I've come across who draws from the book by Laroche on. The French book on the etymology of normos, mm -hmm. which I I really enjoyed and appreciated. Mm, thank you. So you, you you say that normos has been turned against the barbarians, and I don't, you know that we're finding ourselves on a hostile terrain. Do you mind elaborating on that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So normos is a is an interesting term because it's related to economy. The oikos nomos is uh, traditionally the household within sort of ancient mm -hmm. Greek thought. And then with the Salonic sort of uh, transformation of ancient Greece, where they move from a shepherding people to an established sort of settled uh, city-state culture, um, nomos then takes on a characteristic of customary law. Mm. And this is picked up by people um, in a variety of spectrums. For instance, Hayek writes about nomos in an attempt to get out of sort of constituted law and think of a customary sort of right-wing libertarian form of uh, mm -hmm. agreement through consent and consensus among people. DNG, interestingly, appeal to nomos in A Thousand Plateaus is trying to think of it as a form of law that would exist outside of um, the state. And so they go back to sort of the shepherding heritage mm -hmm. and... Uh, in that sense, nomos also means how a group of cattle distribute within an open pasture land without any uh, pre-designed sort of order or direction. They will create their own sort of distribution of things. And mm -hmm. so that already gets into very elementary questions of what a people are as to how they distribute themselves, their goods and services, but also their rights and privileges, you know, th things traditionally thought about in jurisprudence. And then when mm -hmm. doing this research, I found that Paul Lafargue, the uh, son-in-law to Karl Marx, 
and the author of uh, a absolutely amazing essay on the right to be lazy, also appeals to Nomos in a work on political theory in which he tries to imagine Nomos in the very earliest Greek tradition of a shepherding people whose land and whose possessions were determined not by uh, wealth and hoarding, but by casting lots as in mm. gambling and occasionally uh, uh, mixing up and, and uh, uh, transferring it around and allowing no s- single person to sort of uh, gain concentration and control over them. Mm. And so, you know, I was very interested in, in all of this heritage and the, the various ways that could go. But then I imagined, you know, in our, in our great battle today, the state is one of them. And we've talked a lot about that in this interview, but capitalism is the other. And, they, they exist in two very different logics. The state, as much as it tries to network things, still tries to have a sort of first principle of foundational power at the end, whereas capitalism is kind of the opposite. It temporarily mm-hmm. tries to claim its, uh, 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 its right through the possession of private property, which certainly is essential for capitalists. But its most dynamic action is about deterritorializing that capital to temporarily invest it in things like factories, commodity production, services, employment. And so in that way, it doesn't necessarily exercise a right to property. It tries to spread it out to try and find new and different avenues for exploitation. And so in that way, I think we live in a moment in which nomos is actually quite significant because it's being used as a way to figure out how to create special economic zones in countries in which the law doesn't even apply and mm. corporate rule becomes complete. It is how Silicon Valley is trying to create a new app with a very limited set of sort of technical ways to reconfigure social life. And so I think that um, it's not enough today to just say, let's figure out in some sort of non-legalistic, consent-based, uh, cooperative consensus way we need to understand that sometimes that is a really uh, t- terrible version of what's happening to us already, and perhaps even get beyond yeah. that as well. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a that's a poignant note to end on. Do you have any exciting upcoming work that we can look forward to? Sure, I have a essay that just came out in Russian that is my sort of consideration of Anthropocene discourse and my pitch is that it's a failed movie pitch yeah. that uh, didn't exactly land because Hollywood has already made it a million times over from the blowing up of the Death Star to all these other versions of cosmic and planetary imagery that have led to war and destruction. So I try and sort of be a script fixer and come up with a different uh, endings to it. Um, mm. Hopefully it'll come out in English or maybe even some other languages soon. I have a piece on cybernetics that I recently uh, submitted based on some research that I've been doing at the Norbert Wiener archive. And then I have a book manuscript that I'm in the very final stages of polishing off right now. That's tentatively titled imperceptibility, the politics of the unseen. And it looks to these non-formal ways of politics. And I use it more as an exploration of the various aesthetic uh, challenges and new problems that are being opened up and try and not be too prescriptive about it. But Um, It goes into various uh, queer, black, feminist, uh, digital, um, and other like um, non-traditional realms of politics that I think are really interesting and I think the the most exciting stuff that's happening right now. Oh, cool. It it sounds like you're really busy and your interests, the the themes and the topics are quite divergent. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. No, uh, doing what I can. (laughs) Yeah, so, yeah, thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye.